Well, good evening. It is our great privilege to come to the Lord's table tonight. We're going to be celebrating communion at the end of our service. And what I thought I'd do with the message time tonight is to kind of have a topical message on the topic of communion, of our spiritual fellowship with the Lord and with one another. And this is going to be very practical. It's also going to be somewhat theological as we take a look at what the church is and what communion is and what it means and what it, the Lord commands about it. We call the doctrine of the church, the theological term for it is ecclesiology, right? The doctrine of what the church is and what it is supposed to do. And ecclesiology is a very neglected part of God's teaching in modern America. Most churches do not have a strong ecclesiology or an understanding of what the church is to be, right? But if we are to please the Lord, if our aim is to do what He has called us to do, we need to look at God's Word to see what He instructs the church to do, what He says the church is, and what He commands and requires of the church. And one of my great concerns for the churches in America, and especially in recent decades, as compared to, you know, longer history past, right, we can kind of see how churches were run and and structured and ordered in church history and then in recent decades. And what we can see is that most churches and many believers within churches in the United States have a fuzzy or a weak understanding of the role and function of the church. In America, we're a highly individualistic culture, right? It's all about me and myself and what I want and what's good for me. And we typically in America have a consumer's mentality where we're kind of shopping around for who, you know, who gives me the best feeling, what, you know, what place do I feel the most comfortable in. And most people don't really have an understanding of what Jesus said his church was to be. Remember, the first time the church is mentioned, it's by the Lord Jesus when he says, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. This is not our church. This is his church. He is the head of the church. He is the Lord of the church, and the scripture says that he purchased the church with his own blood. And so the church is precious. It has cost the highest price. And therefore, it's not something that we can play around with. It's not something that we can redesign or that we can reinvent or that we can just play games with. I'm concerned that people don't have a high view of the scriptural blueprint for the church. They have a fuzzy or weak understanding. Let me give you some examples of how that manifests itself, I think that we see practically. For example, you know, probably because, you know, enough of the movies still show church weddings, lots of people think they need the church to get married, but how many people think they need the church to end a marriage? They think they need to come to the church if they're entering a sacred covenant of marriage, but they think they can leave a sacred covenant of marriage without even informing the church. The church, they think, has a role in forming a marriage, but not in restoring it or saving it or even making counsel and advice when things are going wrong. So there's no wonder that our divorce rates are so high, even inside the church as compared to the world. We are secularists when it comes to the ends of marriages private decisions made in private rather than involving the spiritual authority that God has endowed in the church. People often aren't even asking the church for advice on such matters, much less instruction, and much less submitting to spiritual authority as the Lord commands us to do in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. I want to begin there this morning. This is the holy word of God. This is what the Lord Instructs. This is not human opinion, and it's actually not something that we can choose to take or leave. This is what the inspired text says. It says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. 
Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. Pray for us, for we are sure that we have a good conscience, desiring to conduct ourselves honorably in all things. All right, I mean, this is a very striking text because it says that the church leaders are going to give an account to the Lord himself for the souls entrusted to their care. I want to tell you that the pastors and elders of this church take that teaching really seriously. We know that we will stand before the Lord of all, the one who is the head of the church, and we will give an account for the souls entrusted to our care. Well, what are the souls entrusted to the care? That is the members of the church. Those who have formally joined themselves in fellowship to this church, the leaders then have a solemn and a sacred responsibility before God himself to give an account for their souls. But in recent decades, our culture has been eroding every type of authority, right? Parental authority is being eroded. Civic authority is being eroded. And of course, spiritual authority is also being eroded. And the results have been devastating. Our world is filled with much human suffering and great dishonor to the name of the Lord because of the eroding of all authority. I gave the example earlier of marriage, right? Well, how is a marriage formed? A marriage has, as I've taught before, there are three components, right? Three bonds. There's the spiritual bond, right, of the church wedding. There's the civic bond of the civil, you know, the civil contract, right, the marriage license. And then there is the personal bond, right, the personal vows and, uh, and the, the coming together of the couple in a personal covenant. And so there is the spiritual, the civic, and the personal aspects of forming a marriage. Well, how does a marriage fall apart? Usually it falls apart in reverse order, right? First, the personal bond is destroyed, the relationship is destroyed, then the civic bond is undone. But the last domino to fall should always be the spiritual bond, and that is where the church has a responsibility to come alongside folks and help them to seek reconciliation, restoration. This evening, we're going to be taking communion, and so this is an appropriate occasion to talk about the proper role of spiritual authority in the life of the believer. What does it mean to be in communion with the Lord and with one another? The Lord Jesus Christ gave the church two ordinances, baptism and communion. Baptism is the initiatory ordinance, right? This is the means by which the church recognizes that someone is, has a legitimate profession of faith in Christ. They are professing faith in the gospel, and baptism is the means by which we receive them into the fellowship of the body of Christ. We recognize their conversion, and we consider them now a brother or sister in the Lord and part of the communion of the church. Baptism is the initiatory ordinance. Communion is the continuation ordinance, right? It's the way that we, on a regular basis then, celebrate and solemnize our ongoing communion with the Lord and with one another, right? It's called communion because it's a celebration of our fellowship with the Lord and with each other. Communion, as a continuation ordinance, reminds us not to allow sin to break or disrupt our relationship with the Lord or with one another, right? Our fellowship, our relationship, our communion with the Lord and with one another should not be broken by sin. And communion is a time when we are reminded to examine ourselves, deal with unconfessed and unrepented of sin so that our communion can be, as I titled this message, unbroken, right? Our fellowship can be unbroken, So I've titled this message, The Ordinance of Unbroken Fellowship, right? Communion, or the Lord's Table, The Ordinance of Unbroken Fellowship. When we take communion, what are we saying? What are we affirming in the presence of God? We are affirming in the presence of God that our relationship with the Lord and with one another is not disrupted by major unconfessed sin. There isn't something hindering or standing between the Lord and us or between us and other members of the body of Christ. We're in communion. 
with him and with one another. It's sacred, it's solemn. And Scripture actually warns us against partaking of the ordinance of unbroken fellowship if that's not actually true. If fellowship with the Lord has been broken, if fellowship with one another has been broken, and yet we partake of the elements of communion, we are lying in the presence of God. Unrepentant sin that has come between us and the Lord or between us and a fellow believer should cause us to pause and realize I can't partake of the symbol of fellowship if that fellowship has been disrupted by sin. To do so would be hypocrisy. To do so would be a lie of a very serious sort. To do so in such a solemn and holy and ordained by the Lord ordinance. I want to remind you of what 1 Corinthians 11 says. We often read 1 Corinthians 11 as we're partaking of communion. Think of what it says in regard to the danger of partaking of communion in a hypocritical or deceitful way. 1 Corinthians 11, beginning in verse 23. Paul is going to give instructions about taking communion, the Lord's Supper, and he says, for I receive from the Lord, right? And, and again, I want to remind you, this is given by the Lord. These are, these are not things to trifle with. I receive from the Lord that which I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. You know, we should pause and we should say, the cost was so high. Right? The bread symbolizes his body given for us, right, in agony on the cross. Verse 25, in the same way he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Look at verse 27. Therefore, right? Because you are declaring the Lord's death for sin and his coming in righteousness to establish his righteous eternal kingdom, because that's what you're doing when you partake of communion. You are declaring those realities. You are affirming your belief in those realities. Because that's what you're doing when you partake of communion, he says in verse 27, therefore whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. These are serious matters. Verse 28, but a man must examine himself and in so doing he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. Verse 30 tells us there can be serious consequences. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick and a number sleep. But if we judged ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord so that we will not be condemned along with the world. This verse in verse 32, right? If a person doesn't judge themselves, right? They don't examine themselves, deal with the sin in their life. If instead of them judging themselves, they have to be judged by the Lord, God in his mercy comes in, verse 32 says, and disciplines them. He disciplines them. They're disciplined by the Lord. Why? Why does he discipline them? The purpose is given at the end of verse 32, so that we will not be condemned along with the world. The Lord is going to, in mercy, discipline the sinning believer so that that person is not condemned along with the world. That discipline is an expression of his love. We're going to be looking at Hebrews 12 a little later on, which says that the Lord disciplines those he loves. He disciplines everyone that he treats as a son. So partaking of communion is a serious thing. Well, what, are, what happens or what are we to do 
when serious unrepentant sin does disrupt the fellowship? How is the church supposed to handle such a situation? I've briefly taught in a former message on Galatians chapter 6. I want to encourage you to turn there. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. And what I'm going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about Galatians 6, 1, and then we'll look at some other passages that, that t- talk about this process of restoration. But this is what the Lord calls us to when communion is disrupted. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. It begins with the word brethren, right? So this is the word which is referring to the congregation of the church. Brethren, right? You who belong to the church, brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of of Christ. Let's kind of walk through this a little bit, right? The verse begins by saying, look, if someone is caught in a trespass, this is, there's a Greek term used here, and it's kind of an interesting one because it, 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 it talks about someone being ensnared by surprise. And in context, it can mean either that the person, you know, sin kind of took him by surprise and ensnared him, or he was discovered in a sin. So either he was caught by sin or he was caught in sin. Right? Either caught by sin or caught in sin. But regardless of whether the person was caught by sin or caught in sin, the text says that you who are spiritual are to restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. The term that Paul uses here about being caught is broad enough to cover situations where someone is caught in sin or caught by sin, and in both cases, restoration is supposed to be pursued. In other words, the phrase used here applies whether the person confesses their own sin or are simply caught by others when committing it. So regardless of whether they blew the whistle on themselves or someone else was the whistleblower, so to speak, the action is the same. We are to restore them in a spirit of gentleness. Well, what does it mean to restore? This is the Greek word, very important one, katartidzo. It means to make someone completely adequate or sufficient for something. To make them complete, fully equipped for service. Right? In 2 Timothy 3.17, where it talks about the word of God is sufficient, right? It is able to prepare the man of God for every good deed, right? He, it is able to equip, or katartitso, to prepare him for every good work. One lexicon says that this word restore, katartitso, is to cause to be in a condition in which the person is able to function well, to put in order, or to restore. It's used in kind of common Greek by to describe the mending and preparation of nets to make fishing nets ready to be used, right? It's kind of getting it in order so that it can be useful, so that it's fully functional, right? It's, you know, in mechanics terms, right? It's making sure the engine is fixed and tuned and ready to roll. That's what it means to restore, right? It's taking them from a position where they're ensnared in sin to a position where they can serve the Lord and be fruitful for eternity. So restoring them means not only bringing them to repentance, but working to bring them to fruitful service of the Lord. Sin, think of the example of a fishing net, right? Back from Jesus' day. You know, your, you, your life depended on, your livelihood depended on fishing, what if your net ripped, right? So now you're fishing with a ripped net. Well, your whole catch is going to go through that rip. So the net is now useless for service. Well, what do you have to do? You have to catartidzo it. You have to mend the net, get it ready to be useful again to produce fruit, to reap a harvest. The Greeks used catartidzo in another way when they said restore. It's the same word that their physicians would use for the setting of a bone. A bone that is broken, right, makes the limb not only painful, right, but not useful. 
Katartizo was the word they would use to set the bone so that healing could come, so that usefulness could be restored. So the goal is to restore the person to spiritual functionality, right? To fulfill their purpose given to them by the Lord. Well, what do we do if the person doesn't want to be restored? What if they refuse to be restored? What, what do we do then, right? You know, Galatians says if someone's caught in a trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. The text presupposes cooperation, presupposes genuine repentance on the part of the one who is caught in the trespass. What do we do if the person loves their sin more than they love Christ and refuses to repent? I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 18. It's just back in Matthew 16 where Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. In Matthew 18, we see what many scholars believe to be the first command the Lord ever gave specifically to the church. It's that important. Matthew chapter 18, beginning in verse 12. Jesus says, what do you think? If any man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go and search for the one that is straying? If it turns out that he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the 99 which have not gone astray. So it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones perish. This is the key context for the passage on church discipline. This is Christ, the Good Shepherd, saying, there can be many, many church members in good standing. Things are going well. They're walking with the Lord. There's one who wanders away. The good shepherd goes and searches for the one who has gone astray. And it says, if it turns out that he finds it, he rejoices over that one more than the 99 who never strayed. This is the Lord's compassionate shepherd heart for the straying sheep. He searches for them. He wants them restored and he rejoices over them when they are restored more than the 99 who didn't need the restoration. But then look at verse 15. So we know, right? Okay, the good shepherd, he's going to go looking for the 99 or for the one that's lost. The question is, how does he do that? How does Jesus pursue the straying sheep? The next verses give the how right? Verses 12 through 14 are the what? The shepherd is going to seek the straying sheep. How does he do it? The Lord is going to explain exactly how he does it. And I want to emphasize that, how he does it. Verse 15, if your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. For where two or three have gathered together in my name, I am there in their midst. Jesus is saying, the church is my body. I seek the lost sheep through the church. The church is my hands and my feet to go out and search for the wandering, straying one to try to restore them. To fellowship. Why again? What's the motive? Again, it's in verse 14. It is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones perish. He doesn't want any of the hundred sheep to perish. He's going to go out looking for the one astray and rejoice over it more if it is found than over the 99. So this is how the Lord looks for straying sheep. And notice that there are four steps to this process. 
First, we are to go to them privately and show them their fault, right? This is, this is you know, the, the scripture talks a lot about gossip and slander, right? We are to keep the circle of the knowledge of sin very small. Right? We're to go to the person who is in the wrong and talk to them privately and to show them their fault, right? To demonstrate it to them, show them why it's wrong and how much harm it does to others and plead with them to repent. Gently, right? Galatians 6.1, do it in a spirit of gentleness. So that's the first step. We are to go to them privately. The second step says, look, if that doesn't work, right? If there's no response, then two or three are to go to them. And there's a reason given why it's two or three. It says, so that every fact may be confirmed by two to three witnesses, right? This is not an individual thing, right? This is a God of truth saying, what matters to me is truth and facts. And so I want now there to be a confirmation of every fact. Not a he said or he said or, you know, they said or they said, but an evaluation, a objective examination of the facts of the matter confirmed by two to three witnesses, right? He says, if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. That's the second step. Third step is in verse 17. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church, right? And the church then is, gonna, is supposed to go and talk to the person because it says, if he refuses to listen even to the church, then let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. So the third step is to tell it to the church so that the church can pray for the person, so that the church can pursue the person and plead with the person. That's step three. Step four is if he refuses, he's refused private exhortation. He's refused two or three. He's refused the pleadings of the whole church and the prayers of the whole church. Then the Lord says if he refuses to listen even to the church, right, even to the body of Christ, then and only then let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector, right, which is phraseology clearly communicating in the context of that day someone who's outside of the communion or fellowship of the body. So four stages of church discipline, going to them privately, going to them two to three, telling it to the church so the church can pray and plead and then, it, only then, if the person rejects the pleadings of even the whole church, he then is removed from the communion of the church. So the church discipline process does one of two things. It has one of two results for someone who's in sin. It either restores them or it reveals to them that they don't want to be restored. It reveals to both them and the church that they don't have a desire to be restored. They don't want to be in communion and fellowship with the church. They don't want to be bound by the laws of God and of righteousness. They, they want to go their own way and be free, right? They have, as the psalm says, let's throw off their fetters and their chains and be free. So church discipline either restores the sinner or it reveals the status of their heart. Either restoration or revelation, right? It restores or reveals. By the way, church discipline is important not just for those who have sinned, but for those who have been sinned against. Church discipline, the, the process of confirming every fact by two or three witnesses, enables the body to know the truth, the church members to know the truth. And in doing so, it protects and vindicates the innocent. Church leaders and those who are witnesses examine the evidence, they confirm every fact. And so it protects the innocent from gossip, from slander, from false accusations. There's another thing that church discipline does is it protects the church. It, Jesus says a little leaven will make its way through the whole lump. I remember a pastor sharing about a conversation he had with actually a criminal investigator and this criminal investigator said, you have no idea how many people we catch who are members of churches, right? So the investigator was a believer, he's talking to a pastor, and he says, it's just astounding. And he says, and it's amazing how often the church will do nothing, 
right? And so here's a police officer saying to the pastor, why don't you people police your own movement, right? You know, and we, we've seen in our day what can happen when churches fail to exercise spiritual discipline. Innocence can be harmed, right? When we, if we, the scripture says it's wrong to either condemn the innocent or to acquit the guilty. We are to protect the church because the leaven of sin will spread through the whole lump of dough. We also need to protect the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Members of the church bear his name, his reputation out in the world. If we do not practice church discipline, we are enabling and participating in the slandering of God's name through blatant hypocrisy. I want you to notice how many of these passages indicate that the church discipline process is endowed with spiritual authority that God has given to the church. In Matthew 18, it says that what you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven, right? The decision grammatically there is first in heaven, then it's manifested on earth. In other words, the church, via this process, if we are obedient to this process and doing it according to Scripture, the church acts as the Lord's agent, as his hands and feet, as his body, and therefore implements his will. And in Matthew 18, 19 through 20, Jesus says, look, if two, or three, if two of you agree on earth about anything they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. For where two or three have gathered together in my name, I am there in their midst. The context in which those words occur are the context of church discipline. What is the Lord saying here? He's saying when the church does this, right? When the church is my means by which I seek the straying sheep, I'm there. I'm the one doing it. I'm doing it through the church, but it's me who's doing it. That's why it's called in 1 Corinthians 11, being disciplined by the Lord, not by the church. Notice Paul didn't say in 1 Corinthians 11, you're being disciplined by the church. He says you're being disciplined by the Lord. Verses 19 and 20 in Matthew 18 show that the Lord Jesus is present and acting through his body, the church, when we properly obey this command. This is how the good shepherd seeks lost sheep. This is how the good shepherd reveals wolves in sheep's clothing and removes them for the protection of the rest of the flock. So we call this church discipline, but really probably a better term for it would be the Lord's discipline. It's the discipline of Christ himself. And this gives a lot of hope and tells us what is really going on in the process. In Hebrews chapter 12, listen to these words. He's talking about our struggle against sin. It says, you have not yet resisted against sin, right, to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin. This is Hebrews 12, beginning with verse four. It says, and you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons, right? Don't forget that God speaks to you as sons, saying, my son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. And he scourges every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you endure. God is treating you as, with, like, as like a son. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are an illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good so that we may share his holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful but sorrowful, yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Do you know what the Lord's end goal is? His end goal in this process is to give to the straying sheep the peaceful fruit of righteousness. So there is temporary sorrow in the discipline and a harvest of righteousness and of peace that follows. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, right? Those who learn from it, respond to it. Afterwards, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Therefore, strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble and make straight paths for your feet 
so that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed, right? A straying member is a part of the body of Christ, and that broken part needs to be put back in order, right? Catartizo, the setting of the bone. Pursue peace with all men, verse 14 says, and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many be defiled. That there be no immoral or godless person like Esau who sold his own birthright for a single meal. For you know that even afterwards when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought for it with tears. And then the end of the chapter talks about how we're coming to God, a holy God, And it says at the end of the chapter in verse 28, therefore since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. These are serious matters. The Lord disciplines those he loves. He wants to give them the peaceful fruit of righteousness. That's why James 5 then calls to the church and says, my brethren, if any among you strays from the truth and someone turns him back, Let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his ways will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. And that's the verse with which James ends his letter. Incredibly important. To turn a sinner from the error of his ways. Go back as we close to Galatians 6. Just be reminded one more time. It says, Brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. We're now going to come, the men are going to come and serve the elements for us. And we're going to partake of the Lord's table again, which is the ordinance of ongoing fellowship, right, of continuation. It's symbolizing our union and communion with the Lord and with one another. And so I would urge you to do as the scripture says in 1 Corinthians 11, to examine yourself and in so doing partake of the elements. Let's pray. Lord, we do come to your table. Lord, we come to you with reverence and in awe. Lord, and with gratitude for your love and your mercy and grace. Lord, we thank you that you have the heart of a good shepherd and you seek the straying ones. Lord, each and every one of us stray. And we thank you, Lord, for the people that you bring into our lives who have those private conversations with us. Groups of brothers that come alongside of us to restore us. Each of us has benefited from this process. Lord, and so we give you thanks for it. For it is indeed a manifestation of your love as our Heavenly Father who disciplines us because you love us and treat us and receive us as sons. And so we come now to your table with that heart. In Jesus' name.